Dobro večer. Večeras s nama jedan od najvažnijih suvremenih belgijskih planarskih pisaca, autor velikog broja knjiga, poezije, romana koji je upravo izašao i na hrvatskom, inače prevedeno je pogotovo sve važne svjetske jezike, romana koji je obilježio planarsko križenost nekoliko zadnjih godina, Dame i gospodo, Štetan Hjertovic, moj sredo. Zadirat će njegov hrvatski urednik, Roman Simić. Sa engleskom, razbog će se voditi na engleskom, slobodno budite slušalice za simultano, prevodit će Hrvoda Hefer. Evo ga, prije nego što ja počnem i napravim svoj dio predstavljanja i razgovora, zamolio bih samo Stefana da vam pročita, da osjetite malo tekst o kojem ćemo već raz pričati, dakle, jedan kratki samo otvaranje slikara i rata romana koji je i sada, molim vas ovako, znam da je malo kišnjikao i znam da nam je čovjek donio loše vrijeme u Hrvatskoj. Dajte jedan topao, topao pljesak za Stefana Hermansa! Slikar Rathiter Pentin. 
večer ćemo razgovarati o njoj. Kada razgovarat ćemo osim o njoj i o nekim drugim stvarima koje mi se čine važnim za Hedmansa pisa, razgovarat ćemo o toj nekakvoj polifoniji glasova koja se provlači kroz cijelo njegovo dijelo, razgovarat ćemo o tome na koji način dijalogizira kroz u svojim dijelima, bilo da se radi, bilo da je riječ o romanima, esejima, poeziji, sa drugim velikim imenima svjetske umjetnosti, dakle ne govorimo o samom kuženosti, govorimo o slikarstvu, govorimo o glazbi koja je itekako prisutna u svemu što Hetmas radi. Moje prvo pitanje, Stefan, za vas je ovo. Dakle, za neka knjižena dijela i za mnoga knjižena dijela nije presudno Neće Džonovi su odličeni. Nije presudno znati kako su nastajala, što ih je stvorilo, što je priča i za romana. Međutim, čini mi se... Čini mi se da je za ovaj roman to bitno. Da je bitno s jedne strane zbog toga što Geneza priča o nastanku dijela čini jedan važan dio romana. I drugo, zato što upravo ta nekakva razmeđa fikcije i fakcije koja je prisutna u njoj, znači je karakteristična za vas, za svijet koji stvarate. Tako da, možda je to najbolji način da počnemo. Kako je roman nastao dvije velike bilježnice od preko šesto stranica teksta koji ste dobili od svoga djeda? To je početak i 30 godina nakon toga ste ih otvorili i počeli pisati romanu. Yes, that's how it went. In fact, I got the notebooks from my grandfather. He wrote... He started in 1963. I was 12 years old. And I remember he was painting almost with his porcelino on his head and his very nice sort of Flemish cravat he had around his name. And when he couldn't pick, he was writing. And everybody knew he was writing about the First World War and his memories. We did not dare to ask him what he was doing. We saw him doing it. And mostly it was on days when he was melancholous, when he was sad. So a few months before his death, <clears throat> I come to the house. I lived in the park already. In that period, I was 30 years old, before, just before he died. I had my hair up to here. I played free jazz. That it was not tobacco in my cigarettes, if you see what I mean. And my jeans were torn. So for him, I was lost for civilization. I was barbarous, I was lost. Because he was a very well-bred, our military, Catholic, old-fashioned person. And still he gave the, 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 the books to me with a sort of uh, gesture like, whom else should I give them to, you stupid? Maybe you can do something with it. So he gave me, in fact, his soul, his history. I didn't realize. I said, oh, fine, I got the, the, the notebooks from my grandfather, and what is in it, I know it, it's First World War. All of my youth, every day, I heard him talking about the war. You gave him a cup of coffee, he said, oh, coffee in the trenches in the war was so bad. <laughs> he saw a plane flying over, he said, oh, the planes of the Germans, we took down. So everything for this man, he lived to be 90 years old. He was wounded five times in the war. He survived miraculously. Everything reminded him of the war, and I knew it. So I, I was not even curious to see what was in it. But then from time to time, I moved from one place to another again, and then you find it in, the, in one of the, the hardcore boxes with your books, and oh, my grandfather's notebooks. I promised him to do something. And I opened it, and I saw those beautiful first lines, yeah. You know, we had one of those handwritings you don't see anymore, of people who have learned to write in the 19th century. It's like printed, so beautiful. And I was there in, in um, Dutch, my very precious Gabriel, my grandmother. I went to your grave today. Ave Maria, grazia plena. And you know, I was so full of emotion, I shut the book and I said, I can't do this. It's too emotional. I'm afraid to. So he waited 50 years after the war to take it down. And I waited 30 years before I made my novel. So that's 80 years of waiting before this story has been told. And I think it's good because, you know, at the end, 
This is a book about the war in Belgium, absolutely. It's a book about many things, we will talk about it. But I think in the first place it's a book about time. What time does for people, how you change by getting older, what it does with your memory, with your souvenirs, how you can be marked tragically, deeply traumatized, and how you wear this all your life in yourself. And when you're a, a strong person, it becomes a quality. Uh, Dakle, napravili ste jedan fascinantan roman. Roman koji, kao što se spomenuo, vi kao autor ne bojite se, recimo to ovako, da ostanemo u metaforici ili u ovom u slikama Prvog svjetskog rata. Dakle, ne vjerujete da su žanrovi rogovi, ne vjerujete da moraju biti strogo suprostavljeni, nego kod vas sve to klizi, povezano je, esej ulazi u tkivo romana, jezik može biti lirski, na mnogo načina, na mnogo načina, unutra su fotografije, znači nekakav postupak koji i kritika je spomenula Zebalda, vi ga i sami citirate u trećem dijelu, znači uzimate njegov dijel njegov iz ostalice, čini mi se, kao moto. Na kraju krava i Zebal često odlazi u Belgiju i često govori o fortifikacijama i zapravo o uzorcima Prvog svjetskog rata itd. Kako svačate, kako ste zapravo, to nije nešto novo, vi od samog početka prvog nagrađenog romana zapravo rado eksperimentirate i ne razdvajate, ne razdvajate striktno forme. Kako je ovaj roman u tom smislu nastao? Znači formalno rekli ste da ste tražili način kako ispričati vjerovu priču. Dobili ste njegove dnevnike, dobili ste tekst koji je njegova sjećanja koje je pisao, mislim, u 72. ili 3. godini na događaje koje su se događali 50 godina prije. Znači, kako ste tehnički to izvrli? To put it politely, for four years it had been a terrible pain in my past. It was so difficult to write this book, because in the beginning I was so moved by what my grandfather wrote, and you should know, I don't know how it is in Croatian, but Flemish and Dutch is a language that Um, changes very rapidly. Only in my lifetime, the, the, the dictionary has been changed six times. We change spellings, we change vocabulary, and it's always adapted. So Dutch has been modernized very much. And for people, for some maybe it's not very clear, Flemish is, is Dutch. But Flemish is Dutch being spoken in a slightly different way, with other dialects, other expressions, other idioms. You can compare it to the German that is spoken in Austria, in comparison with the German that is spoken in Frankfurt. It also has a different literature. So we can speak about Flemish literature, but she is part of the great Dutch literature, just to tell you. So, because I'm a writer of my generation, I write in Dutch, I don't write in Flemish dialect, but very much what my grandfather wrote was archaic Flemish dialect. And I was so moved in the beginning that I typed it up and said, his name has to be on the book. I'm only his servant. But it didn't work. He tells too many anecdotes, he these things, uh, or, or he's, he quotes little songs from his youth. And I thought, this is not going to fascinate the modern reader. So then I thought, but what am I going to do? I want to stay true to him. This man has fought my youth. He was a hero of my youth. He made my house, he made my swords, he learned me to, to skirmish. He, he, he was the man who gave me all my dreams. He learned me to paint in oil. I stood next to him in the field painting. So I thought, how can I stay true to this magic figure of my youth with his dark remembrance of the First World War traumas? So I started writing about him. Uh, at one time, I had already 10 pages only for his birth scene. So I was really, you know, opening it up. And after 70 pages, I thought, if I continue like this, I'm going to be a Flemish Charles Dickens. <laughs> so that's not what I should do. He was so poor, there are stories that, for instance, he goes to beg for two pieces of charcoal in the morning at 6 o'clock at the locomotives. Because if he doesn't go to beg for charcoal, his mother can't cook. 
That's how poor the cities in Flanders were in the 19th century. So I thought, how am I going to tell this? And I'm very happy you make a reference to Zebald. For those of you who know Zebald, to me, he's the most important writer after Nabokov. He really found a new form, which is a form of telling fiction on the basis of non-fiction. And this is what I did. I'm doing it in my next book too. It's a very wonderful way of doing it. You have a document, historically founded, and then you say that now I have to add my own story to it. And his own story was my autobiography. So I had to tell about my own youth, about my own feelings, but my grandfather was in prison. And then you can add, my grandfather was a modest man who became a hero. He wasn't interested in being a hero, but he became one. How can I stay true to him in telling this story? I have to add things about the war. What do people know about Flanders and the war? Almost nothing. Practically nobody knows what the Germans did with Flanders. It was so terrible. They burned, for instance, our oldest library, our oldest documents about literature have been bombed by the Germans in Louvre. They did it again in the Second World War. And still you have very many Flemish who were pro-German because they hated the French-speaking bourgeoisie in Belgium. We will talk about it later. It's a very complex situation, Belgium. Then I thought, how much of this history do I put in it? Because I'm not a history writer. I want to make a novel. Some people ask me, why is there a novel in your book? It's not a novel. It's not fiction. So no, no, it's fiction too. So and all this to me, Zeebald is the great master. Because what Zeebald learned me is when you want to return to such an important story for the national identity of your people, the only thing you can do is realize out of intellectual honesty that you can never find the truth. You can find stories. This is a beautiful saying of Judge Conrad, who said, when people ask you what is the sense of the history in your country, you can only answer by telling your own life. Don't start giving nationalistic stories. Give your own life. And this is the position of literature. We don't give nationalistic stories. I don't give one either. But I explain a lot about Belgium. You see? And in all this, also this is for me a very beautiful example, that's true. In so far even that I put in some of those grey pictures as well, in order to tell you, look, we don't know what it was like. We are different people than those people going to the First World War. We are really different people. But it's so far away, and still you want to understand it. So our, our love of literature, faith based on history, is also our frustrated love to know how it has been. That's why I describe so many odors and smells. That's how it was. Da, to je ovo ste spomenuli opis Genta oko 1900. kroz mirise koji se tim gradom u još jednoj fazi industrijskog, praktički industrijskog evropskog grada su bitno drugačije nego ovi danas. Ali spomenuli ste vrijeme, spomenuli ste tu rekreaciju. Na jednom mjestu pišete pišete mjesto nije samo prostor, mjesto je i vrijeme. I ono što vi radite kao kao dio vaše istrage, detektivske, da otkrijete koji je to svijet u kojoj je živio vaš djed, koji je bio vaš djed, da ispričate na kraju kraja tu priču, vi posjećujete mjesta koje je on posjetio ili mjesta koja su važna za vrijeme u kojoj je on živio. Dakle, idete gentom, odlazite u druge gradove koje je posjetio, odlazite na mjesta velikih bitaka, na grove i tako dalje. Ono što je meni zanimljivo u kom trenutku ste vi kao pisac osjetili to drugo vrijeme. Znači, sigurno ste imali neku predvežbu što je bio početak 20. stoljeća, imali ste kroz literaturu, imali ste kroz povijesna dijela, imali ste kroz slikarstvo, imali ste kroz glasbu. Međutim, intimno svjedočenje člana obitelji je nešto posve drugo. I vjerujem da kad ste ušli u rekreaciju toga, da ste otkrivali stvari. Zapravo u tom smislu to je ono što bi Oster rekao metafizički detektiv. Gdje je vaš metafizički detektiv odveo? Što ste otkrivali? To je veoma difficult question, because what you think to discover before you write a book, what you discover during writing a book, and what you discover years after, 
when you're talking about it, as I do for years now, is different. You talk about metaphysical things. What I discovered, of course, on that level, to begin with the most abstract of the world, is that our illusion of autonomy, which is so very important to us as today people, I make myself. I come from my parents, but I, I emancipate. I become someone myself. I learned that, to a large part, this is an illusion. I've always thought I've made myself. I went away from home. I went to university. I lost my Catholic faith because I started reading Nietzsche, and that's how it goes when you're an intellectual. And I became leftist, etc. And I was engaged in political movements. And I thought, I'm completely estranged from my family. I'm an independent person. I've been writing about all modern artists in Belgium. I've been teaching at an art academy for 40 years. I thought, that's strictly my life. In writing this book, I said, no, I'm the product of my family. I'm the product of this man. He learned me everything about art. It's his, his genes in me. There is a passage in the book where I walk the landscape of the trenches, which has been had. If you see pictures of 1950, 1916 in Ypres and Bokelin, in the southwest of Flanders, it's worse than the moon. There was not one brick standing above another one. If you go there now, it's peaceful. It's an ecological landscape. And I've heard one farmer saying when I was a child to my parents, you know, grass is thick here from the bodies in the ground. That's the landscape. And to see this landscape, to realize what it is about, makes me realize that there is something transgressive in all that. I'm not just myself. I describe myself walking there with his genes in my body. And the older I get, the more I begin to resemble them, you know some sort of sick identification you get at the end. Like you begin to like being like your dog or something. <laughs> or I begin to look, be like my character, like my grandfather. But no, being serious, it is what you do when you go so deep into a motive of the book. You see that transgression over time with your family, with the country, the culture you belong to, becomes more conscious in yourself. And this is transgression. If it's metaphysical, I don't know. But it's transgressive, it's transcendency. Absolutely. Spomenuli ste promjenu u konkret, znači u vama, konkretno u vama koja se dogodila zbog svega, mislim, u kojoj je ugrađen život vašeg djeda i vaša zemlja i kultura iz koje ste ponikli i tako dalje. Ja bih vas postavio jedno pitanje. Što bi se jako svidjelo u knjizi, između svih poznane stvari, zbilja preporučam, sjajna knjiga, ovo nije samo zbog toga što se čovjekom razvojam ovdje, nego časna riječ, dobro. Ono što bi se svidjelo da knjiga nije zakupana u neko abstraktno drugo vrijeme. Ona je cijelo vrijeme, prošlost, ovo o čemu smo sad pričali, je stalno titra sa sadašnjošću. Dakle, prvi dio knjige u kojem narator sa svojim sinom odlazi u London, je upravo ta tanka opna i cijelo vrijeme je zapravo ona titra. Ne samo kroz odnos naratora i njegova djeda, nego i naratorova sina posredno sa cijelom ustavštinom obiteljskom odnosa o kojima taj teško ne zna praktički ništa i ne treba znati. Ja bih sada, znači knjiga se zove Slika i rat u našem prijevodu, ja bih sad se zadržao recimo na tom ratu da počnemo sa ratom, jer je rat stvorio slikar i zato što je rat na neki način učinio ga onim koji je postao. Dakle, Urban Martin, vaš protagonist, vaš lik, to je ime naratova djeda u knjizi, stvoren je, on je slikar kopist, recimo to će nam biti važno u nekom nastavku razgovora, stvoren je stvoren je ratom, a taj rat za njega se kaže i puno puta se napisalo da je promijenio Europu, da je promijenio svijet. Znamo da je umjetnost, da su se velike promjene događale i prije njega. Međutim, ono što vi majstorski hvatate je ta promjena u čovjeku 
koji je donio rat. Znači, promjena u pojedincu koji je sudjelovao u tom ratu. Promjena u Urbanu i njegovim kolegama i sa jedne i sa druge strane rola koja se događa. I sad, ono što ja vjerujem je da svaki rat mijenja čovjek. Međutim, što je posebno u Prvom svjetskom ratu, što se dogodilo da je to djetom na kudi kamo široj skali. Dakle, da možemo reći da se čovječanstvo promijenilo nakon toga. I think you will kind of change out of the First World War. Uh, in the first place, the complexity which led to this war is far more uh, intense, it's far more complex than the Second World War. It's the end of the world of an equal, that's clear. And things were changing already. Modernist art was approaching, photography had been invented, uh, technical inventions were coming one after the other. Speed became a, a, a value of its own, traveling with speed, and so on. So it was already changing, but those simple people, of course, in such a small city, they didn't know. I imagine the interior of the house of my grandfather when he was a child of 10 years, something like on a painting of Vermeer in the 17th century. Oil lamps, water in a can. There was no running water. There was no electricity, there was no telephone, there were no trams in the street, um, there was no saxophone, there was no jazz, there was no woman emancipation, there was not liberation of sexuality, there was even not radio in their house, let alone television. There were no planes in the air, there were no cars in the streets. So he, he comes from this time. And at the other hand, this modernist huge wave is approaching, but they don't know. How do they come into contact with it? By war. When the Flemish, the Belgian soldiers, sorry, in the beginning of August 1914, are mobilized, and Belgium is at war, Belgium's going to believe it. We have nothing to do with the Serbian question, with Gavrilov Princip and Ferdinand. You thought so. <laughs> we had nothing to do with it. Why did they, why did they uh, found Belgium? Do you know that? Belgium is founded to keep the machos, France and Germany out of each other. It's a buffer state, created by them. That's why we, the Flemish and the Balloons, still play French-German war in a puppet uh, format. Yeah. So, we are the transition between the Latin and the German-speaking world. The Latin and the, the, the great northern world. We are really a, a mixed people. So we were created just in order to give stability. The first thing the Germans do when they want to attack the French again is saying we're going through Belgium. Of course our, our king, Albert I at that time, says no integrity of, of, of the territory you create in Belgium yourself. You're not going to come through Belgium. At that moment the Germans say, okay, if you don't let this pass, you're on the wrong side. We attack you. We were absolutely not prepared. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that Belgian soldiers thought they were going to a second edition of the Waterloo Battle. Some sort of deadly football match somewhere in the, in the fields where they kill each other for two days and one of the two wins. They did absolutely not realize that modernist technology was coming. What the Germans were importing over Lutic, for instance, with the Zeppelins bombarding from the sky, nobody had ever seen that. They were shitting their pants. They didn't know what was happening. My grandfather testifies that after three weeks, his rifle didn't work anymore because the steel was of not good quality enough for such a war. They didn't have group steel like the Germans. We were not prepared for a war. We were not part of anything. And this is, of course, why there was such an indignation in all the world, saying you should not attack this small country. That's unjust. Because everybody thought if they're going to attack the French again, they're going through the Alsace. But you didn't go through the Alsace. You had the von Schiefer plan, which was to go through Belgium. And then this small mouse, Belgium, begins to shoot back. And this really enrages the Germans. And that's a huge propaganda machine that's saying the barbarous Belgians, uh, children of ten, cutting out the eyes of the noble Goetheian German soldiers, all of these lies that are telling. And you see that the Belgians, from after two, three weeks already, the French are mobilizing, the English are mobilizing. Because England in the beginning was a bit, you know, offhand. 
They had good relationship commercially with uh, Germany. They didn't see war. But at that moment, there is the Triple Entente, which is France, Russia, and England defending Belgium. And this is where a war begins that nobody could foresee. Do you know that two or three years ago, they discovered in the Flemish Polder somewhere a bunker, which is a Senegalese mosque? There are 65,000, 56,000 names on the Great Manning Gate in Ypres. Most of them are Indian, of Indian uh, uh, descent. There are pictures of Bedouin soldiers on camels on the sand. I thought they were pictures from the Sahara. They're taken on the, on the, the, the beach of Ostend. Everybody was there. And this is what changed the world. Afterwards, the world is so changed. Not only women emancipation, because women had to take over the task of the men. Suddenly they became doctors, Africa, lawyers, etc., uh, politicians. But also everything, technically speaking, changed. And Flanders was broken open. Suddenly they saw what a, a, a guy from mid Africa looked like. They hadn't seen that before in the village, certainly. So everything changed radically. So modernist epoch for those small people does not begin with the art history that we know. It begins with the shock of the war. I collapse, eto sa collapse morala kakav su oni poznavali na jednom mjestu i si kaže da je da je cijela generacija tih mladih ljudi koja je odgojena na jed u jednom moralu oni koji su preživjeli morali su shvatiti da je svijet drugačiji mjesto ima fantastičnih scena u knjizi kada recimo belgijske trupe nalječu na Njemačke i još su uvijek naivni u onom smislu da Njemci se idu predavati i onda zalegne prvi red Njemaca kad belgijanci izađu i drugi red šume oko se belgijance i pripovjedaš, dakle djet koji to pripovjeda je u nezvijen. Zapravo ideja viteštva, kako je još uvijek postala u ovakvom ili ovakvom obliku, jer zadnji veliki rat su bili napoleonski ratovi, zapravo ratovi kontra Napoleona, i bilo je zapravo nevjerojatno dugo razdobne mira pred prvi svjetski rat. I onda se ti ljudi suočavaju sa tim, tom problemom paradigme, čak i ratovanje, iz toga ne izlaze isti. U ovom dijelu rata posvećen je taj veliki centralni dio vašeg romana, pisan u prvom licu, pripovjeda zapravo Urban Martin. Međutim, prvi dio, prvi dio o kojem smo već ponešto rekli o tome kako narator pronalazi i zapravo tretira ono što je ostavšeno na njegova djeda, je zapravo priča o Gentu, o Gentu i o veliki u tom razdoblju oko 1900. godine. I zapravo roman hvata i cijelo jedno stoljeće belgijske i evropske povijesti. Kako je tu, kako vam je taj dio bio? Dakle, kako ste mogli rekreirati te mirise? Kako ste mogli rekreirati ono, to neko zbilja prošlo vrijeme, samo kroz, samo kroz zapise svojega djeda ili... No, I started reading, of course, as many books I could about the First World War, and I got crazy. You know, when I started writing my book, there were already about 100,000 books about the First World War. You should be crazy to try to, to write another book about it. But still I thought, I have a story to tell that nobody has read. There are details in my grandfather's story about the war that I have never read in any other book. For instance, the, the fleeing of the animals in the north. That's an apocalyptic scene. He's the only soldier who has noticed this done. Um, so I started reading history, 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 and at a certain moment I thought, I can't write this book. It's too huge. And then, happily, I have very good editors in Amsterdam who told me, go back to your grandfather, go back to your intimate story. Tell about it, your youth with him. And then I thought, yes, what he wrote, because the remarkable thing is when I started reading his notebooks, they weren't about the war. They were about his father who died young, very young, and he was a church painter. It was about a man restoring the hand of the angel in the church. It was about his mother, who was a very dignified bourgeois woman, coming down the ladder to, 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 to marry this 
foolish romantic artist it, my great grandfather was. It was, you know, my great grandfather died like Tintoretto. Every night when he had cleaned his, his pencil, his pen, his brushes, he licked it. Because if you if you clean them after having painted and you put them back for the next day, they're like this. The hairs are like this. So in order to have a very fine pencil, uh, brush again, they do that. And they poison themselves with lead. So he had this blue line when he died. He was a very poor man, very artistic, beautiful soul. He died like Tintoretto. And by the end of the 19th century in Flanders, in a poor family. This is crazy. So I thought, first of all, tell this story. Tell this story about this poor man and those poor people who dream of art, who thought that art could be emancipation for them. Nowadays, if you look at television, they think that art can kill uh, uh, the proletarian people. Uh, don't give them art. Might kill them. It's elitist. Don't touch them with art. Give them every foolish thing you want in prime time, but never give them art. Those people were poor and they dreamed of art. They saved money to go to see Verdi in the art. And this is where I found the answer on the question of why was this generation so loyal in the war? Why did they do it? Why did he say it? It's running all through the book. We won't come on. We will come on now. Time and again, when he knew he could be killed, yes, I will do it. Yes, I will do it. I found this obeyance of that generation, which is really still a miracle. We would do it. We would say, fuck you, Mr. <laughs> officer. I don't go there. They're going to shoot me. It doesn't work. They sent 10,000 soldiers every day in order to, to conquer a but, uh, 2,000 yards further, which they lost a week after again. They had no respect to the military for the life of the soldiers. And still they were true. And the answer of this I found in the youth of this guy, who was brought up with dignity. He was very naive. He was a very naive man. He was very deeply Catholic, uh, very devout even. Uh, and it is his naivety which turns him into a hero. That's what I like in the story. And two women. Uh, sorry. Uh, I dvije, I dvije žene, uh, dvije žene koje su jako važne za uh, Urban Martina. Uh, dakle, priča je obiteljska, ali priča je i ljubavna. I zapravo odnos prema majci i odnos prema najvećoj ljubavi njegova života, uh, koja umire u veliku epidemiji, pandemiji velike gripe nakon samog rata i što radi, što radi vaš junak, on, on zapravo iz osjeća dužnosti uzima, uzima, za, uzima za ženu njezinu sestu. I čini se da je to ključan moment koliko god da je da Urban Martin o ratu priča kao užas u svoga života, zapravo kao, kao nekakvom velikom, on ga baš u jednom dnevničkom zapisu kaže to je moj užas. Zapravo je tragika i dramatika njegova života upravo ta, čini mi se na emotivno, jednako velika i na emotivnom planu, u kojem, u kojem i zapravo ono što mi se čini jako bitno za roman, to nije rat i roman, da razjasnimo odmah, to, nije, to je roman koji priča o ratu, ali, ali cijelo vrijeme Uh, jaka emotivnost, zapravo taj svoj, taj svoj života je silno, silno važan i u njegovom životu. Uh, ono, što me, ono što me fascinira, koliko, kako ste uspješno prikazali tu suspregnutost osjećaja, zapravo to tajnje. Uh, vaš junak, kad ga, kad ga portretirate u 40. godini, znači godine otprilike, kako možda ima neko publica uključujući mene, on je gotov čovjek, vi kažete, taj čovjek je završen na neki način. Jako puno se promijenilo vrijeme, a sve ono što nama danas puno znači, o čemu volimo pričati, o osjećajima i, i puštamo ih na volju, u tom njegovom životu je sabijeno, komprimirano, prigušeno uh, i rađa, rađa neki plod. Znači da vam reći nešto o tom aspektu uh, romana i, i lika? I think even The part of his heroic character is his silence. People of that generation, ladies and gentlemen, they couldn't speak for you. They couldn't say, I'm traumatized, I'm frustrated. He didn't have the vocabulary. Silence. 
this Borsalino besides him in the church, praying to the Holy Virgin Mother, suffering, 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 and still being a person who was the most joyous man I've ever seen. He was a man that could have tears in his eyes when he saw a little flower in the side of the, the, the road. I said, you look, if you want to paint that, and then he summoned all the colors I needed to, to, to mix up it to be, <laughs> to be able to paint the flower. So he was constantly in a sort of state of émerveillé, um, they uh, say in French, uh, being bewildered by things. And at the same time, he couldn't speak about certain things, because he talked about the war every day. But what he wrote in his uh, notebooks, that was different stuff. There you could read that his friend was dying with his bowels out of his belly, asking, Mommy, 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 let me die. Right? At 3 o'clock in the morning in the mud, it was real hell. And then this very sensitive man who adored his father and his mother, because we, we're going to talk about the women. Um, this man comes back from the war and he has no vocabulary. And he learns to know this girl, 22 years, brilliant, very beautiful, tall girl, um, and as a copy of his mother. There's a whole game of copy and original in the book, because it's too complex to talk about it. You will see when you read the book. It's about what is original in your life and what is a copy of something else. And it's clear that he had an Edipian love for his mother. It's Edipian. He adored his mother too much. And his mother was, as he describes her, a tall woman with black hair and very pale blue eyes. And when he was an old man, he still said to me, that's one of the great duties in art. So he tried to objectivize his mother. And what happens, he comes back from the war, and he falls in love with a girl, so a few streets further, who is just exactly the copy, the younger copy of his mother. This girl is called Maria Emilia, and she dies of the Spanish flu. You should know that in the war, 10 to 12 million people have died. In 1919, 100 million people died of the Spanish flu. They all embraced each other, they all made love with each other, and they were all contagious, and they all were very weak, weakened by the war. So it was like a fire going around the planet. This girl also dies, and what happens? Um, his future father-in-law says, you're such a friendly guy, wouldn't you marry the older one you still have here? This, this happened to very many soldiers. Very many people who came to my table when I was signing the book said, my grandfather too, he married a sister of the girl who was in love with. What could they do with it? It was not an open society. So then he marries Gabrielle, my grandmother. And as I, as I describe in the book, there was practically no sexuality. My mother, he called my mother, Maria Emilia. The name of his great love is given to the child he has with a sister. Not nice for Gabrielle, of course. And my mother sometimes uh, made jokes about it and said, I think they made love maybe two times in their life, and here I am. <laughs> and this was maybe, it was not a frigid marriage. It was a marriage of a man who again said, we will come on now. I'll do that, I'll marry her. And he has loved her, but not in a sexual way. I've seen them together when I was a child. They were in fact a beautiful couple, but they didn't have sexuality. He was so much wounded. And there you get this image of a woman in his life, which is absolutely metaphysical. Of course, with this Holy Virgin thing, it's in Catholic religion the last thing to do this. And then it comes into his own life with Maria Emilia, who's also called Maria. Mm -hmm. And all of this has always pervaded his life and his sense for art also. So it's rolled into one. It's Freudian, psychoanalytical, it's religious, and it's existential. Da, da, fantastično mi je zapravo ta, ta priča o toj suspregnutoj tjelesnosti koja se provlači kroz cijeli roman, a zapravo kažete da je jedan put, da je djed, jedan put u životu vidio baku golu i to samo zato što se slučajno vratio malo ranije kući i da je ona nakon, nakon, nakon toga poludila i, i doživio malo uh, slom živaca. Ali, um, ja, bih, ja bih sada, uh, nešto smo bili spominjali prije i čini mi se da, da je taj važan aspekt dijela, spomenuli, ste, spomenuli smo uh, Urban uh, se raža u klasi, određenoj klasi, od, određeno, uh, znači, to je niži, nekakav, niži svoj gen, uh, oni su siroma, siroma, siromašni ljudi. Uh, 
oni su religiozni, vi u jednom trenutku opisujete, dodušno, ne toliko ni u pozadini, pričajući o njegovom ocu, njegovoj obitelji, kako su stvari izgledale, kako su se katolici znali tući sa socijalistima, kako su se događala previranja. I to je nešto što sam vas mislio pitati. Dakle, imao sam tu sreću isto u izvrstnom prijevodu romane Karečinec koja je prevela vašu knjigu, čitati i uređivati knjigu Remih dijelom Kuga Klausa, Tuga Belgije, koja mi je bilo veliki šok. Dakle, prvi put sam se susreo sa svim tenzijama, silovitim, svom silom napetosti koja je u belgijskom društvu postojala prije i tijekom i nakon drugog svjetskog rada. Dakle, gomila povijest, napetosti, ne samo flamanci, valonci, nego sve je uvazilo u priču kako jedan tip otpora spram dominacije valonaca, kulturne ili nekakve socijalne, rađa nacionalizmom, kako onda ti svrstava, kako se svrstavaš zbog toga na stranu koja surađuje sa njemcima i tako dalje. Vašu knjigu, vašu knjigu doživio sam kao poglavlje prije Klausa, da zapravo govorite, iako se to ne nameći, iako nije napadno, govorite cijelo vrijeme o situaciji i kroz rat i prije rata, o stanju vaše zemlje, dakle o tim nabednostima, one su bile tada takve, kakve su danas i kako zapravo ova knjiga i stanje koje vi rekreirate komunicira sa onim što je danas Belgija. Koliko ona govori današnji Belgijancu nešto o njemu samome i koliko su se stvari promijenili? To je veoma kompleks pitanje, jer Belgija je veoma kompleks. Vi možete da je znači o njemu u Belgiji. First of all, the country will never split. It's technically impossible. You cannot split Belgium because of Brussels. We're both in Brussels, and if you have to split Belgium, you have to cut me in two. It's not possible. You could cut me in two. That's up to Now, I'm not going to take too much of your time, but you should know the following. Belgium is founded in 1930 as a unique French-speaking country. The majority of the people speak Spanish. This is suppressed politically completely. We didn't have universities, they didn't allow us. So the French-speaking part of the country, mainly from Brussels, that's not the Walloons. If we speak about the French-talking people in Belgium, beware. There's a huge difference between the Walloons, who are people like the Flemish, and mostly we travel in each other's country and it all goes well. But it's the French-speaking bourgeoisie and aristocracy around the royal house and Brussels. They have been stored almost a sort of racist contempt for Flemish. Even the generation of my father, who's 94, he can still be in a rage when he thinks that he was punished for speaking Flemish. This is what happened. In the First World War, 65% of the soldiers are Flemish. That's not the, the, that's not the, the guilt of the Walloons. They, uh, um, they were taken much uh, uh, swifter than we. So we could mobilize more. It's a technical detail. What happens, of course, is that 65 to 70% of the soldiers are Flemish fighting for Belgium, and they are hurled back in French. That's a stock phrase in Belgium that says, if you let Flamand and them shows, and for the Flemish it's the same, translate it yourself, assholes. But fine, give your life for this country, but we don't respect you. This is what radicalized the Flemish movement. It started in the trenches. It's very clear, the Flemish nationalist movement has started in the trenches because in fact, it was um, a class uh, fight. It was a class fight. But the class fight in Belgium was expressed by the difference in language. French became the symbol of humiliating uh, normal, modest people. The same went for, for Walloons. The Walloons were speaking dialects at that time. Walloon boys who hadn't gone to school didn't understand the French of the officers. And very often those officers who were hurling in French were Flemish. Because when a Flemish had studied, they hurled in French. He wasn't allowed to, to, to talk Dutch. There is a very famous saying by one of the bishops in Belgium who said, La Belgique sera latine ou elle ne sera pas. Belgium will be Latin or it will not be. Which was, of course, a stupidity. 60% of the people speaking a German language. So when they founded Belgium, they made a huge mistake. And this is what comes up with the First World War. People have enough of it. And you see that the Flemish movement turns into a collaboration with the Germans. 
They think that the Germans will allow them to have their own culture and to let them speak their language. In 1916, General von Bissing in Ghent opens the first Dutch speaking university in Ghent. You know what the Flemish professors did? They manifested against it. It was given by Yemi. You couldn't be in favor of it. This explains the schizophrenia of the Flemish. At the one hand, they will always say, oh, we are Belgian. You know, for, we're from the land of Tantan. We're, we're, we're very observed. We're so fine. Oh, we're so nice. We're such a nice democracy. They make a fool of themselves in order to be sympathetic. At the other hand, they're full of wounds, very deep, spread wounds. They know they have collaborated with the Germans, but you shouldn't do anymore. You don't collaborate with the enemy who attacks your country, clearly. But they have. Very often, there were cultural and intellectual people who did that, who loved reading Goethe and really, and who loved German culture. I said, we have enough of this arrogance of the Brussels aristocracy and bourgeoisie suppressiveness. But what do you choose when you have to choose between the lies and the fleas? I mean, it's, it's very schizophrenic. And if you trans, you see that what happens in the Second World War. Collaborating in the First World War, okay, it was a war crime. On uh, the other hand, very much of our culture, me too, I wrote my doctorate on a German poet. I mean, it's, it's a culture which is akin to our culture. I adore uh, German philosophy and literature and so on. But in the Second World War, this becomes, of course, collaboration with the Nazis. That's a different story. So what you have now is that no progressive intellectual in Flanders wants to be a nationalist. Every intellectual in Flanders is a real intellectualist, anti-nationalistic. We do not want to be associated with a movement which has gone so far in order to want to split up Belgium to collaborate with Nazis. This kind of freeing your works up to today. We again have a new separatist party, you might have heard about it, the new Flemish alliance with Barty Waver, who wants to split the country. It's rubbish. I tell you again, you cannot split the country. Does Flanders, when it becomes independent, want to lose Brussels? Is the only metropolis in the country? Do you do that? 300,000 Flemish go to work in Brussels every day. What are you going to do with them? So, this complex country, which is the battlefield of all the European trolls, consists out of its own paradoxes. Just to tell you, I pay the highest tax rate in the world. We pay 60, 56%, because we have five governments. We have the Belgian federal government, we have a Flemish government for the Flemish, we have a French-speaking government for the Walloons, we have a government for the German-speaking part, which was added to Belgium after the First World War in order to punish the Germans. It's four, and then you have a fifth, which is Brussels, because Brussels is nobody's territory. It's everybody's and nobody's. And since European Parliament has taken it away from us, Brussels is not a Belgian now. Brussels is now Merkel Hollande. Uh, so it's, it's an occupied city again. So if you see this complexity of European politics being concentrated in that country, which has its own identity crisis between the French-speaking culture, it is very familiar with. I think, I always say Flemish people are the only German, are the only people who speak a Germanic language, but who have a Latin heart. We have a French speaking heart, but we speak a German language. And this is exactly also the richness of our great artists, of our literature, because it's mixity. We are mixed people. We are border people. And everybody who wants to split Belgium will kill the special character of his country. And this is why Nationalist politics hate culture, hate artists, because they know we're against that. We want to keep this country in this complexity it has, but it is not simple. And this gives way to the most complex, sophisticated political solutions, which will never work longer than 10 years before we again have to change them. But it's the laboratory of democracy in Europe. And if Belgium splits, Europe will split. Because we are the paradigm of what it is to live with another culture and to be proud of it that you have another culture, that you have two hearts in your breath. And this is the tragedy of the Flemish people to me. We are a Germanic people, but we are, we are so different from the Dutch. Speak with somebody from Holland. There are other people in another culture. They speak the same language as I do. They speak it with a very different accent. We in Flanders have the impression that they speak American. When they say the grass is green, they say the grass is cool. 
We said, that is good, we have said softly from the south, you know. <laughs> to them, we're already in all your state. We're, we're, the, we're Latin. But this is very interesting. So, also this literature. If you read a book from a Dutch writer, you read a book from somebody who's far more familiar with German culture, who is a Protestant. If you read a book from a Dutch author, who is Flemish in Dutch, you read a book from somebody who's Catholic. We were taken by the Spanish in their Contra Reformation, for instance. We were split up from our own roots very long time. So all of this is also in the in the background of my book. And I take my grandfather, this modest man, as a prism of all those great complex situations. And I don't analyze them. I let you feel what it is like for a single man to live in that country.
he became that famous copyist. But in the copies, ladies and gentlemen, he had secrets. And the most beautiful secret is the secret of his great passion. In one of the copies, you will read it. And what I did in my book is, I made a triptych. I'm the lost painter. I'm the lost copyist. I copy him and I hide my own secret. And the book is in fact like in a Catholic church. You have this Saint Martin as a boy. It's like hagiography. You have Saint Martin as a soldier in the war. And you have Saint Martin in the desert of his old days weeping over his eternal love. That's the story of the book. So I'm the last copyist, I'm the last painter. And this was for me the, the central drive, together with the fact that I have dropped his only thing he had from his family. His only treasure was a clock, a watch I got when I was 12 years for my funeral, and I dropped it. So I dropped his time. I let his time fall to pieces, and it was out of guilt. Because all of us who survive people, we have a certain guilt. The Jews know that very well. Surviving already in itself gives you a sense of guilt because you're living with God. And what we do with our grandparents, for instance, or with everybody we have loved, it's only when they disappear that we start to ask questions. I say, I should have asked that. Was it like that? Or what was it? And you know, it's like, you know, it's like that owl of Hegel. Hegel has said of wisdom, and it's like the owl of Minerva. It only flies at dusk when day is gone. It's always too late when wisdom comes. The same goes for your memory. It always comes when it's too late. So there's a feel of sorry in me. And this feeling of sorry, together with this magic of this man, was really a prism of a great war and a great time. That was my central drive to write the book. That's mine.